we're in a new series because it's a new year. In case you didn't know, my birthday was New Year's Day. And so, not that you have to say happy birthday or anything. I just, I, I, ha- I have a fond attachment to the new year because the new year always brings in new stuff. And uh, honestly, the coolest thing about having your birthday on New Year's Day because I, I struggle sometimes uh, with words and just, you know, shooting the breeze. So when someone says happy birthday, I can say, well, happy new year to you too. Because yeah. it's like I got something to say back. And that's my favorite part of it is that I don't have to just go, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting old, thank you. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. <laughs> anyway, we're in a new series and it's entitled New You Resolutions. And uh, we based it out of 2 Corinthians 5.17, which simply says that if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone and the new is here. The new is here. And uh, if you missed last week, you're welcome to go online to our website or to YouTube and you can pick it up. But there's something about the newness that God wants us to walk in that far surpasses what we truly can imagine, because we can't seem to shake what we see in the mirror. When we look at our life on a daily basis, we we look at the things we say, the things we do, our perceptions. Sometimes we just look at our natural self, and we're like, man, I can't shake what I see. And because we can't shake what we see, we struggle to believe that it could be any different than what it is. But I'm telling you that in Christ, man, you can be completely new. There's, there's a new life and a new way of living and a new way of thinking that God has for you. That's a beautiful thing when you start really focusing in on that. And so today I want to open up with Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and here's what it says. It says, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but it's Christ that lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I no longer live, but it's Christ that lives in me. So today I want to talk to you about the simple but very complicated truth of your identity is in Christ. That's your little post-it reminder for the week. Your identity is in Christ. Write it on a post-it note, stick it in your car, stick it on your mirror, stick it on your fridge so that you are reminding yourself on a regular basis that your identity is in Christ. It's not in how you look. It's not in how much money you have. It's not in your job. It's not in any of these other things. It is in Christ if you are a believer. The simple definition of identity is the fact of being who or what a person or a thing is. So your very nature, who you are as a follower of Jesus Christ, can only be found in him. And when you are in him, that is your identity. You know, we live in a world and a culture that kind of um, talks a lot about self-image and promoting who you are, and, you know, people make uh, careers out of themselves. They really do especially in this, uh, you know, modern era of uh, social media and stuff, we can totally promote who we are and we take videos of our life and, and people pay to watch you and to hear from you and to see your thoughts and your perspectives. And so it's pretty wild. And so really what our culture teaches is the best thing for you to do is to focus more on yourself so that you can be the best you that you can be. That, that, that really is the concept, because it's all about you. And if you're struggling, it's, it must be because you have a poor self-image, because you must not really see who you are and the potential of who you are. So you need to take some you time. You need to set apart some money, some, you know, some time, some whatever it is, so you can just focus on you. And if you focus on you, man, you can be the best you ever. Does anybody kind of see a little bit of arrogance in that? Just a little bit of the wrong shift and the wrong focus. Now, ultimately, if you go back to Galatians 2.20, it says it's no longer I that lives. So then if you're struggling with identity, 
and you're supposed to be developing the new you, then your identity must not truly be about you and focusing on you even more isn't going to help you. You're still going to be frustrated. You're still going to be discouraged. You're still not going to be satisfied with who you are and you want to, you're going to want to keep changing you and tweaking you and fixing you and you coloring you and you know you dressing you and, and you whatever it takes to make you feel like the you that you think you're supposed to be. But that's not how it works. The reality is we don't need to love ourselves more. The reality is we need to love God more. Because the more we fall in love with God, the more we begin to see the beauty of who he is, which then gives us the correct filter to begin to see who we are in him. And that's a very different approach. Romans chapter 12, verse 3 says this. It says, For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Now, in no way am I saying you're supposed to hate yourself. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the focus isn't you, because if the focus is you, most of us will have a tendency to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, because we forget that everything we have comes from God. Our abilities, our gifts, our talents, our personality, as pastor would put it, just our good looks, <laughs> right? Just straight from God. That's where it comes, right? <laughs> and we can't make that the focus. That can't be what it's about. It needs to absolutely be Christ. So somewhere in there, we have to figure out how this works. So there's a verse of uh, Scripture in Ephesians, and here's what it says, chapter 1, verses 17 to 20. It says, and, and this is Paul, and he's thrown out of prayer. He says, you know, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the, the glorious Father, will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Okay, I want to stop there for a second. So there is this, this place where our identity is supposed to be found in Christ, but to truly figure out who we are, it's going to take God and his wisdom and his insight and his revelation for us to even begin to grasp who it is that he's even called us to be, let alone who he is. And if it's his spirit on the inside of us and we don't know him, then how can we truly know this incomparably great power that's residing inside of us that has the ability to completely make us new and transform our lives? We've got to connect with him. But I feel like the problem is there's kind of like two worlds. And last week I talked about our old life and our new life, and I'm going to kind of do a little flip on it this week. It's kind of like trying to live in two separate worlds. Now, I think most people know that I was born a Canadian. This is my Canadian passport right here. I won't show you the picture. I've aged a little bit. But this right here is my American passport. It is not possible for me to have allegiance to two countries and to live in two countries at the exact same time. It is not possible. Not at all. And so I struggled with the concept of fully investing in this country. Even though it's given so much good to me. An amazing wife, an amazing family, an amazing, you know, um, opportunity to serve the Lord. This country has done so much for me. But it was a battle to shake my old life. It was a battle to shake my old identity. I was a Canadian. I loved being in America and saying I was Canadian. 
Now, a lot of things I did just gave it away, you know, but, but I won't go there the way I talk, and, you know, they're like, why are you taking your shoes off? <laughs> Our floors are full of mud. I'm like, I don't know, I just can't, it's a house, I, they got to come off, you know? So there was a lot of, there's a lot of Canadian in me that just gave it away, but it was so hard for me. I lived here year after year after year, knowing that God had called me here, but I struggled being completely in because I couldn't shake this identity. It's, it's, it's who I am. It's, it's where I was born. I love taking the Canadian flag and sewing it to my stuff, and you go around the world, and you're like, you're a Canadian. <laughs> I am. Yeah, <laughs> I'm living in America, but that's all right. I'm, I'm a Canadian, you know? But one day, the Lord dealt with me, and he dealt very strongly with me. And he said, all right, it's got to be one or the other. This is a real deal. Actually, even our country understands that. Because for me to become an American citizen, I had to say a whole little thing. I had to study all about American history. I might know more than some of you out there. And I had to take all these tests, reading, writing, all of that, you know, speaking. I don't know. I'm amazed at some people who become citizens because I'm like, how did they pass that? <laughs> because, but anyway, sorry, that's... <laughs> That's nothing against them, but I was just like, you actually have to be able to, re you know, read English and speak English, and there, there's a lot of, there's a lot to it. So anyway, God was really challenging me, and so I had to be willing to finally say, okay, I'm going to stop saying I'm Canadian, because God's called me here, and if I'm here, I'm going to be 100% in. And so I went ahead, I filled out the paperwork, I got a picture of my wife and I the day I became an American citizen. I look a lot younger there. <laughs> anyway, um, and I didn't take that decision lightly. It was a process. It was a process. Because I had to be fully in. Now, Canada doesn't say that I'm no longer a Canadian. I had to say I'm an American. I can walk into Canada anytime I want to. I can walk in and out of it as much as I want. But I had to say I'm an American. I don't pull up to the Canadian border and show my Canadian passport. I pull up to the Canadian border and I show my American passport because I'm an American. And this is where I live, and this is where God has called me. And I'm fully invested. I had to settle it once and for all that this is the world that I was going to live in. Now, do you guys see the spiritual parallel here between the world we live in and the world God has called us to live in? But we have such a hard time separating the two. Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. It says, For, as I have often told you before, and I now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame, because their mind is set on earthly things. Verse 20, But our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is is in heaven. Now, I, I want you to, to grasp this concept. Our citizenship is in heaven. The, the old is gone, the new has come. I now identify by this. But do you want to know what's so crazy? It's hard sometimes to tell the difference. I'm like, okay, wait, is this what... Man's telling me to do or God's telling me to do? Is, is this a God thing or, or a, a fleshly thing? Is this a, and it's hard sometimes to, to get clarity if you're not connected and focused in making sure that you have made the decision once and for all, I know where my allegiance is. I know where my allegiance is. Do you guys realize I had to basically sign a thing saying that if we go to war, that I would fight against Canada? Think about that for a second. But yet, I'm where God's called me to be. 
and I'm fully invested. But yet look at how easy it is for Christians to shift their focus back to the natural, in the natural world, and be moved and, and stirred up and, and frustrated and excited and happy and everything about what happens in the natural, but yet our allegiance is supposed to be to God and his kingdom. That's where our citizenship is. That's what should take priority. That's where we should be focused. That should be the filter of everything that we do. But yet most believers walk around and they're like, yeah, I don't think it really matters. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm a Christian. But nobody knows. We're not really declaring with our lifestyle, with our choices, with our attitude, with our actions, with our demeanor, where our true citizenship is. And I think it's very important. If you've never settled that issue, <laughs> it's time. It's time. Hebrews 11, verses 13 through 16. This is the roll call of faith. These are some men and, and women of God. And in verse 13, it's talking about them. It says, all of these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them, and they welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. Foreigners and strangers. That's how we're supposed to live our life on this earth. Do you, do you realize that if you're a foreigner, like if, if I go to a different country besides Canada or the U.S., I am a foreigner. I actually don't have any rights or privileges there. And that country has nothing that they owe me. Did you see that? You understand that concept? So then, if we're supposed to be foreigners and strangers in this world, then really, there is nothing that this world has for us or that we want. It has no rights to us and we have no ties to it. But instead, because we aren't foreigners and aliens of this, I mean, of heaven, that's where our citizenship is, then there is benefits and blessings that some of us don't even begin to tap into because we're not identifying ourselves as fully committed citizens of the kingdom of God. But when you are a fully committed citizen, you understand what you get to do. You understand the benefits, the blessings that come with that, and you tap into them. You tap into those blessings because you know that it's part of being a child of God. My citizenship is in heaven. I get to talk to my heavenly father. I, have a, I am connected with him. I get to hear his voice. He's watching out for me. I'm watching out for him. We're in covenant. It's an awesome relationship. We're in this together. I signed on the dotted line. I'm all in. This is who I am, and this is where I'm going to keep my focus. James chapter 4, verse 4 says this. It says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God. Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. So there's many times where we'd say, well, I'm not really a friend of the world. But yet, we find our identity in it on a daily basis. That's where we're getting our identity. That's where we're getting our purpose. That's where we're, we're getting our joy, trying to get our joy and our peace, or that's where we're losing our joy and our peace. And, you know, we're, we're losing the things that we're, we're all wrapped up in because we're, we're not fully grasping and fully committed to who it is that God's called us to be. So why does it, why does it matter so much that you understand your identity? Why does it matter? That is a great answer, but I was being rhetorical. <laughs> I'm kidding. I love it, Amy. You're awesome. She's engaged. She's listening. She's like, I know the answer. I got it. I got it. I'm going to hand her the mic. That is sweet. So here's, the, here's the, the, the deal. This is why it's so important. Because whatever you depend on it becomes your identity, and it becomes the source of everything, which means it controls your life. So if you depend on your job and you get your identity from your job, then your job is going to control your time and what you do and what you don't do. 
If you depend on what other people think of you all the time, if you're depending on natural relationships for, for, for finding your identity and your purpose, then you are going to give control to people. And people will either lead you astray or they'll hurt you or they'll misdirect you, but you are going to be at their mercy because you're finding your identity in people. Or if you find your identity in money and how much you have and how much you need to have, then that's going to be what controls you. And then you'll start making decisions based on whether you have money or you don't have money. And the Bible very clearly tells us that is a horrible way to live. But you see, where you find your identity will determine what controls your life. But yet, if you find your identity in Christ, then you're putting yourself in a place where he can absolutely begin to control your life. But it's a good control. You're yielding it. You're asking for it because you're understanding, oh, oh man, I never could have done this by myself. I never could have got a wife like that. I never could have got a job like this. I never could have got the joy, the peace. I tried. I couldn't do it. So at some point, we have to make the decision, all right, I'm not going to be identified by anything else other than Christ. Stefan, will you come up here for a second? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use Stefan as a little analogy here. I just looked at him and I'm like, yeah, he's a good analogy today. <laughs> so this is what most of us do when we're trying to discover our identity, all right? This is what we want people to see. This is what we want people to know us as. <laughs> I'm not going to say what his job is because his job is not who he is. But we'll do his job. We'll do money. We'll do friends. Man, you are firm. <laughs> 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 He said he was flexing. <laughs> we'll do our, our physical abilities. In other words, our athletic abilities, you know, what we can do. You know, we'll, we'll do our talents. We like people to, to see our house and that kind of stuff. Or maybe we like people to see our car. Or we like people to maybe see our handsome good looks. See, this is what we'd like to be identified as. And it's like we, we wear it as like a proud, this is who I am. And we walk around like, I would like you to meet Stefan. This is who he is. This is everything about him. These are all the great things, the good things. But yet, what's interesting is even with all of those wonderful things, we still struggle with finding identity in wrong things as well. But when it comes to like the junk in our life, like the sin and the things that we haven't been able to get rid of, we don't want people to see those. We still struggle with that identity, but it's not what we walk in with. Hi, <laughs> I'm addicted to pornography. <laughs> that, that's not what we do, right? I'm not, just so you know. <laughs> Bad example. <laughs> All right? So we have our fears. We have our failures. And, and these are all things that a lot of times identify us. We, we have our flaws. You know, maybe you haven't noticed, but like my ears are different and they even look different. I mean, it took me probably 14 years of my life to even put my hair behind my ears. I covered them up. You noticed? Oh, now you know. <laughs> but you see, I don't care. All right. So we have our weaknesses. So we have the things we love to be identified by. And then we have the things that we don't like to be identified by. But yet it's amazing that no, ma no matter how much we try and hide these things, that they, they, they creep out and people see and they know. But yeah, well, no, that was just like one time. You know, that's not really who I am. I know I said that, but I don't always gossip like that. That was just, that was me and you, you pulled it out of me, you know. <laughs> that, you know, and, and, and we like to try and cover up and, and, we, and, and this is what we like and we want to build on our strengths and we want to hide our weaknesses when really... This is what we're supposed to be doing. John chapter 17, verse 14. It says, I have given them your word and the world has, hate, has hated them. I'm like, you stay right there. 
because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Okay, just, just listen to this for a second. I've, gi- I've given you my word. And something about truth in the word makes people uncomfortable. John 15, 19, if you belong to the world, see, God's just trying to shake all that good stuff off of you. (laughs) It would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, and this is why the world hates you. So here's what I want you to see. I don't care if it's good, bad, or indifferent. There's only one place that you are supposed to find your identity. The new you is only going to be found in one place. And I'm telling you, if you don't spend time in God's presence, if you don't spend time in his word, you are going to get a confused, messed up concept of who you are. You're going to try and be good enough and not realize that, wait a minute, I don't have to be good enough because it's not about me. I just have to die to myself. It's about him. It's his goodness coming out of my life. It's his love coming out of my life. It's his words. It's his wisdom. It's his insight as long as that identifies you. But I tell you, we will gladly, and I used to do this, I would gladly tote around my Canadian flag. I would proudly do that kind of stuff. Man, that old self just sticks to you like you wouldn't believe it, (laughs) right? And then I come to America and I make the decision and I'm glad and I, and, I, and I put my American flag on my house and I fly it proudly. And it's like, these are the things that I'm willing to throw out there. But yet, where is our citizenship? It's in heaven. So the thing that people should know, thank you, Stephan, I appreciate it. The thing that people should know about us more than anything is who we are in Christ. Who we are in Christ. Because that's all that matters. That's all that truly matters. But we have got to put ourselves in there. So really quick, I'm going to give you two things that I think are really important. Here's the first one. And I'm just putting this as a point now, even though I said it. You need to see yourself through the word. Matthew 10, 38 through 39 says, And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. If you try and find your life, you're going to lose it. But if you lose your life for my sake, you're going to find it. So I don't care how great you think it is or how bad and how much you've been trying to cover it up. It's time to just shake all of those things off because there's only one place you're going to find the new you, and that's in him. And we've got to get to that place where we start seeing ourselves the way that God sees us, where we start thinking about ourselves the way that God thinks about us. You know, sometimes when we're so self-focused, when we're so motivated and moved by people's either compliments or their insults, and we use those as motivating or as fuel to get us where we think we want to be, We get totally frustrated, discouraged, and then we find ourselves in a cycle of trying to live up to somebody else's standards. And you're never going to be good enough. You know, I was one of those kids who pretty naturally could pick up almost anything, whether it was sports, except singing. I just couldn't pick that one up. (laughs) Anything but that, right? Um, But if I just put a little bit of effort, I was was a good just kind of get her going. But yeah, man, when, you, when, when the rubber really met the road and I had to take it to the next level, I could never be good enough. I could never be good enough. There was always somebody better. But when I took the focus off of me, and I said, okay, it doesn't matter what, what people say. It doesn't matter what people think. You know, actually, I, <laughs> I was thinking about this concept. We have all these, like, shows on TV now where people get up and they do their talents and they... Sh- and, and, and sometimes, and maybe somebody else thinks this, I'm like, doesn't anybody love them enough to tell them that they actually don't have talent in that area? That it's actually not what they're probably called to do? That, like, why did you have, why did you let them get on a national stage and get, I'm like, to me, that's like way worse than, than just your mom or dad saying, you know, I kind of love you, but that's not your gifting. 
But yet there's some people who they don't want to tell anybody anything bad. So they just, you're awesome. You're the best. You're the greatest. You can, if you want to sing, then go and sing. And then finally someone goes, you need to do something else. <laughs> right? But again, that, that's the danger because you're, you're living based on what people are going to tell you. And most people don't like to tell you the hard things. But you know, when you look into God's word, he has no problem telling you the hard things. <laughs> Because he loves you, and he cares about you, and he wants to help you. He wants you to be all that you can be, and he wants you to find your identity in him. And you're not what you do. You're not. All those things I put on Stefan like a necklace, that's not who he is. And he's great at a lot of those things. That's not who I see. I see a man of God. I see someone who loves the Lord. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, when you're with your kids, you feel like a dad, and it feels good to be a dad, but your kids grow up and they leave. You know, when you're at work and you can do good and it feels good, you know, and I feel like, you know, a great employee when I'm there, but what if you retire? Then is your identity gone? You know, you can't put your identity in that stuff. You know, I know I'm called to pastor, and I love being here, and it's a blessing, but if someday I'm not doing this specific thing, I'm not lost. I'm not. I wouldn't be lost because that's not my identity. I have not attached my identity or my citizenship to anything in this world. I love where I'm at. I'm invested where I'm at. I'm not being a fool. But let me tell you something. My heart, my mind, and my emotions are connected with God. That's where my citizenship is. So you are not what you do, but you've got to make sure that you are seeing yourself through the word. And then I want to close with this. One more thought. Matthew chapter 22, verses 36 through 39. I had a dramatic pause there because I'm skipping a whole bunch of my thoughts. That's what that was. <laughs> She's like, why are you pausing? I'm like, because I just went through a whole page of notes. <laughs> Here's what it says in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. I just picked a different verse too. I know. I Amy, I like this one better. I'm sticking with it. It's my message, not yours. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1. Here's what it says in verse 20. It says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have complete boldness, so that now as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. In other words, in this natural body, in this world, I, I actually want Christ to be glorified. I want my identity to be in him, not in anything else. I don't want people to look at me and think, well, you got a great house or a great wife or a great family. I want people to see Christ and who he is and his love. That's what I want them to see. Whether by life or death, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. So if our life is wrapped up in him, and to live is Christ, then there's one other thing that we need to make sure that we do. We've got to make sure that we are seeing others through the word as well. Because I tell you, as much as we identify ourselves by all those things, we are so prone to identify, let me rephrase that, to judge other people by all the outward things that we see, by the natural. I mean, just the other day, I was driving down the street, and, you know, there's a young kid there with a sign, hey, looking for work, you know. And I tried to, you know, not make eye contact. And, yeah, he doesn't know I'm a pastor. <laughs> and so, and the Holy Spirit just spoke to my heart. I need to go talk to him. So in the natural, I want to judge him because he's standing there. And I'm like, you know, it's not, that's not fair to me. I need to give him a chance. So I pulled over. It was a long, annoying way to get over. I walked up to him. I said, hey, how's it going? Pretty good. And I said, well, I told him my name. And I said, you really want to work? He goes, yeah, that's why I got a sign. Okay? I'll tell you what. If you really want to work, you got a phone? And I know he has a phone because he was on his phone. Here's my number. Call me. And I said, if you're willing to come and work for me for a couple days, and you prove yourself to be a good worker? I know lots of guys who have businesses who might be looking for a worker. So here's what I had to do. I had to not judge him because he's standing there with a sign. I, I had to, but we do that all the time. 
We miss out on opportunities. We miss out on people. We're called to let our lives glorify God, to reflect his image and his character and his nature and his love. But yet we go out and we immediately start putting labels on things all over people the same way we struggle with it ourselves. And then we wonder why God's not doing through us what we want him to do through us. It's because people can tell when they're being judged. People can tell when they're being labeled. Now, so sometimes they're wrong because, you know, it's, we can't get wrong perceptions. But yet, if you're constantly portraying something, it's evident. If you're, if you're trying to come across as you're more than, you're better than, you don't, then people will sense that, they'll feel that. And then the very thing you've committed to do which is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength, which is the exact same as loving your neighbor as yourself, you can't separate the two, then you miss out. Because part of why we're in this world is for people. And, and I say this all the time. I, I believe that if we weren't in this world for people, then I think God's got enough wisdom that the second we said, all right, God, I want to make you the more Lord of my life, he'd go, awesome. Here we go. Come home. <laughs> Your job's done because it was all about us being reconnected. But it's not just about us being reconnected with God. It's about everybody being reconnected with God. And once we have that connection, once we identify as a child of God, once we identify that our citizenship is in heaven and that's who we are and that's where we live, then now we are in this world and we're not looking for people, for two people, for accolades, for promotions, for pat on the backs, for anything. When you truly walk in the love of God, people will either be turned off and they'll hate you or they'll want what you have. And God's softening hearts. And there's people out there who want what you have. But the problem is they don't know that you have it. They don't know what you have because you've been so focused on everything else. Who are you? Well, yeah, I'm a, I'm a professional whatever, or I'm a this, or I'm a that. And that's, that's how we introduce ourselves usually. Now, you may disagree with me on this, but when I meet somebody for the first time, I never introduce myself as pastor. I don't. It's not my identity. It's my calling. It's what I'm doing. And I have no problem with somebody calling me pastor. But it's, for me, it just, it feeds the wrong things. I want to make sure that I am, I'm on that level. I, I am a child of God and I'm called to love on people and I want to love on people. And that's, that's my focus. That's what I want to do. And I hope that's what you want to do.